Good morning, ladies and gents. I do, there are a few gents. Good morning. Um, I like, let me push this back because I am a Baptist minister and probably don't need it this close to me, right? I hear a couple of ministers laughing, Baptist ministers. Uh, good morning again. I am uh, Dolores McQuinn and delighted uh, that you are here this morning as we come together as women, uh, African-American women uh, and women of color to just address an issue that is certainly so important to us uh, and that's bridging the divide, empowering women through equity. Uh, and I dare say each of us have had an opportunity to have some kind of or some discussion on this particular issue. But I want to welcome uh, each of you here this morning to Virginia Union University. I've been honored to have the opportunity to work with uh, the uh, administration here and others, Ms. Felicia Cosby, who's running around here somewhere. But, oh, there she is. She's not running right now. So I certainly want to thank her uh, and for the uh, tremendous efforts that's been made to help make this day uh, possible. And also to my staff uh, that's been working it's diligent as well. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity to have, again, some discussions on the divide that seem to exist in our society and have existed for a very long time. And so we want to be here to hear from these experts and colleagues and great women, uh, bipartisan women who are coming together to, again, to talk about empowering women through policy. And I know that it's going to be a powerful discussion, and I ask that you listen, and at the appropriate time, there may be some suggestions that come from those who are here today. Um, we, we are in a changing society, and we no longer uh, are only bringing food, to, bringing food to the table, we have a seat at the table. And while we're sitting there, we've got to be able to make sure that we bring about change, effect change, and not just change, but transformation in the lives of so many people that are connected to us. And so at this time, and then I will come back, I want to um, ask that the assistant provost of uh, Virginia Union University would come forward, Dr. Jacobs, and that she would greet us in her own way. Thank you. Let's give her a round of applause. Good morning. It is good to see you all. And welcome to Virginia Union University. On behalf of our president, Dr. Hakeem Lucas, we welcome you. And our senior administration here, Dr. Leah Carter, the chief operating officer, and Dr. Terrell Strayhorn, the provost. I am Mignot Jacobs, the associate provost. We are delighted to have this panel as we discuss how we together build bridges to close the equity gaps. We understand that a bridge is constructed with many and diverse parts, each functioning to make a strong structure. Our panelists are those structures. Our panelists are those diverse parts. They bring diverse perspectives and experiences, but are each charged with the well-being of the communities in which they serve. We welcome you all. We look forward to this conversation and the results that come from this gathering. For we understand that while it takes a village, that village operates in a very diverse world. And we must together create policies that are for the benefit of those in that village and for the village and the globe. We thank you for being here. Welcome, and we look forward to our time together.
Thank you, Dr. Jacob, for those words and that very warm welcome. As we um, just, you know, this is a timely uh, moment and opportunity for us to have the discussion on uh, bridging the divide, uh, empowering women through policy. Uh, because of the month, October, and October is a month that uh, we have historically for years uh, just acknowledge the issue of breast cancer awareness. I am happy to see my good friend, childhood friend, since we are five or six, Zelma Watkins, who actually was the one, yeah, that um, the founder of Sisters Network um, uh, Incorporate uh, for Central Virginia. But um, the issue of breast cancer, there's, as we look at equity, that is one of the greater issues that we know in terms of health care that affect uh, black women and women of color, uh, the lack thereof. The, even the disparity is so great as it relates to the services that we get, as it relates to the resources in the African-American community to make sure we are connecting with those whose uh, lives are such, so impacted by this particular issue. As most of you probably know, I'm a breast cancer survivor. And so this is certainly something that's near and dear, near and dear to my heart. But when we talk about bridging the divide, bringing people together, making sure that the resources are made available, this is certainly one of those things that would be high on the radar for us to begin to address, and that is the issue of health care, not just breast cancer, but all kinds of health issues that are, you know, African American and women of color are affected by. And so I just want to, on your table, you have brochures, please take them with you, please share them, and uh, I'm certain that Zelma, at any time uh, that you want to talk about it, she'll be ready uh, to be uh, in, that, in that discussion. So just looking at what we're doing, we, you know, we are, again, as I said earlier, we're in a changing society, and we're no longer only bringing food to the table, we have a seat at the table. And it's important that we have the space to address the intersectional issues that women often face in the workforce and other areas. I always say when we were doing, uh, we're doing the period where there was a lot of protests, between protests and progress is policy. And while we aren't protesting in the typical fashion, even this event is a wake-up call. As the young people say, we've got to be woke, okay, in terms of how these things are affecting our lives. If it's affecting women, then it's also affecting our children, it's affecting the male factor, it's affecting our communities, the churches, you name it. And so we must begin to have this discussion in a way that uh, we understand that the, you know, the whole issues of you know, education, uh, health uh, equity, uh, the pay economically, all of these things must be a part of our discussion. And so as we um, uh, have this discussion again with our panel today, I'm hoping that you will listen and as you listen, that there will be some great things that could be brought to the table, again, as we address the issue about the gaps, the disparity that we are dealing with. With that being said, I would like to also take this opportunity to introduce uh, to you our moderator for the morning, uh, the Reverend Dr. Rosalind Brock. Dr. Brock is a highly accomplished senior health uh, policy advisor with demonstrated expertise and social impact, advocacy, health equity, community health, uh, strategic policy, analysis, coalition building, stakeholders, name it, she's every, all, what is that song? Every woman, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but even with all of that, she is a long time awesome friend that we have um, just uh, through ups and downs been connected over the years. She's also the godmother of one of my grandbabies. So she must be special, right? Right. But um, she is my sister, 
she is my one that I love dearly. We enjoy sometimes very long conversations. Sometimes we fuss and fight like sisters do, and then we immediately make up. Uh, but all of that makes for much better sisters uh, as we uh, take this journey together. So at this time, I would like to introduce uh, to some and present to others none other than the Reverend Dr. Rosalind Brock, again, our moderator for the morning. Thank you. Let's welcome her. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Well, no, it's still morning. I apologize for that. So, this together. You have been welcomed to this important policy conversation that endeavors to impact the lives of women across the Commonwealth. During our conversation, we will address the critical issues that are important to women in this Commonwealth. Those issues are related to health care, the impact of COVID-19, mental health, gender pay equity, education, and the economy. We're celebrating a number of firsts here today. This is the first time we've had the opportunity to have two women of color running for the lieutenant governor spot in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's something that we can all celebrate. And it's the first time we're having this conversation about a bipartisan conversation, which is so critical. We need to send this message to Washington that we need to have bipartisan conversations uh, in a collaborative manner that are used to promote gender and racial equity with legislators who are willing and unafraid to work across the aisle in order to identify solutions for social impact for our nation and for our world. And so they understand that we are stronger as women when we work together in unity. Their presence here today is a powerful recognition of the fact that we have come a long way but we still have a mighty long way to go. And so we will begin to have this conversation that seeks to bring about awareness and share important information on how we can begin in some areas and then others continue to get into what the late Representative John Lewis said, quote, good trouble. <laughs> so let me introduce at this time our panelists. I'm pleased to introduce to you, starting on my far right, the Honorable Paula Ala. Excuse me. Let's get back here. The Honorable Paula Ayala, who was born and raised in Virginia. She understands the Commonwealth's history, its challenges, and its many opportunities. As the daughter of a Salvadorian and North African immigrant father and an Irish and Lebanese mother, Hala reflects the growing diversity of the Commonwealth and the strength that it brings to our future. From the local PTA and statewide women's advocacy groups to serving on the McAuliffe Council of Women, Hala has long worked for progress. In 2017, she helped to organize the first women's march in Washington. I thought somebody was going <laughs> Seeing millions of women stand up against the division and hate inspired her to run for office. She ran for Virginia's 51st House District and won a four-term Republican incumbent in the diverse and fast-growing suburbs of Prince William County. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Next to her is Professor Tanya Scott Hickman, who is the Associate Professor of Business Management here at Virginia Union University. 
Dr. Scott Hickman is an alumna of Virginia Union, earning a BS in Business Administration from the Sydney Lewis School of Business. In the, she also leads the Business Development Unit, which is part of a Corporate and External Affairs Division, and is tasked with supporting economic development, most specifically in the North Richmond through micro and small business development, identifying enterprising opportunities, and partnering with MBEs and micro businesses to scale up and build the capacity of minority businesses, bringing much needed services, retail, food, and products to underserved communities. Let's give her a big round of applause. Our next panelist is Dr. Chelsea Cosby Morgan, who is a board certified family physician based in Washington, D.C. She currently serves as the Deputy Director of Comprehensive Health for the Veterans Administration National Office of Women's Health. She also sits on the Council of Women's Physicians Concerns for the National Medical Association, the largest and oldest national organization representing African American physicians and their patients. Blessed with the gift of teaching, Dr. Morgan has educated a wide range of communities, including elementary schoolers, senior citizens, and church congregations on mental health, sexual health, and chronic disease prevention. Let's welcome Dr. Chelsea Cosby Morgan. We're also joined by members of the General Assembly. We are so pleased to have the Honorable Carrie Conner, who serves the people of Chesterfield, Prince George, and Hopewell in the Virginia House of Delegates, where she, yes. <laughs> where she is developing a reputation for working across the aisle on improving our schools, protecting victims of domestic violence, and fighting drug addiction among teenagers. Carrie grew up in the Chester area, the same community she and her family still call home. Her parents taught her from a young age to love people through service, and that means actually doing something. Before being elected to the House of Delegates, Carrie served her community on the Chesterfield County School Board and as a board leader for the Chelsea YMCA and on the Elizabeth Scott Elementary School PTA. She's currently the children's choir director and a Sunday school teacher at Chester United Methodist Church. Let's give her a big round of applause. And last but certainly not least, we are pleased to have Delegate Don Adams here with us. Let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Delegate Don Adams is a nurse practitioner elected to represent House District 68 in 2017 and was re-elected in 2019. She was the first Democrat elected to represent the district in three decades and the first openly lesbian member of Virginia's General Assembly. She's been an incredible, effective representative working across the aisle to pass key legislation important to her and her district. She is a healthcare and environmental champion and serves as the health professions chair within the Health Welfare and Institutions Committee. Dr. Adams has 35 years of diverse clinical administrative healthcare experience and formally taught health policy in the doctoral nursing program at Old Dominion University. Let's give her a big, big round of applause. So, as we begin this discussion, we'll begin by having some opening comments from each panelist, followed by specific questions that I will give to you in the areas of health, workforce, and education. Questions will also be taken from the audience. On each of your tables, there are some index cards and pencils. If, in fact, you would like to raise a question, please write it down hold it up in the air and we'll have someone come by and pick it up and bring it to me. We hope, uh, if you like, you can put your name and your affiliation on there. I may or may not read it. 
but I just want to let you know it's up to you to put it on there. And please, no commentary, no speeches, just the questions. Because we really want to hear from our leadership, right? So we promise that we, we can't promise that we'll get to all the questions, but we'll do our very, very best. So at this time, I'm going to start where I ended with the Honorable Delegate Don Adams and ask you this question and then we'll go all the way down. Please tell me a little bit about yourselves and at what point in your life did you realize it was important to you to be on the front line of policy making? Apparently this is uh, supposed to work if I hold up really, really close. Okay. Um, thank you so much for having me and thank you for the question. I really appreciate being able to attend this forum. And, um, you know, I think I've had many moments in my life when I felt like policy was important. I remember sitting in nursing school in 1986 uh, in a policy class thinking, uh, this is more important than I thought. Uh, then over time, I became a clinician and like many of us, just getting up, going to work, doing the household chores, and going to sleep and getting up and starting over, I kind of lost a, a, sort of a, a, a policy lens and was really just focused on life. When I went back to get my doctorate in nursing at ODU in 2013, I think that was a life-changing uh, experience for me because I realized that policy actually in, in affects every single thing that we do every day and that state policy in particular is incredibly important to our daily lives. Uh, so as I... Um, you know, ev evolved in my career, I, I was asked to teach health policy, and as I taught health policy, I, I actually um, made made a role for myself uh, with a lot nurse lobbyist uh, to really see what was going on at that point, and then I was uh, uh, asked to, to create a program uh, for the state of Virginia to help people transition from uh, training centers where developmentally disabled people were residing in group uh, and, and get them out into community. And it was at that point that I really saw the engagement between the executive branch and the legislature and felt like we needed better communicators. And one thing I believe nurses do really, really well is communicate, especially difficult information, complex information, and sort of holistic information in simple terms. So I really uh, uh, believe in the social determinants of health as a, as a conceptual framework to come at policy issues. It's very important to me, and so that's kind of what pa is my passion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Delegate Cordon. Well, again, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here this morning. And um, my start in public policy really began as a high school student volunteering at the Sacred Heart Center and the children I was working with um, coming every day after school, sharing how they were sleeping in their bathtubs at night to avoid being shot or um, that they weren't able to get some of the same books as other kids in the city of Richmond. And um, my first efforts, actually, um, Delegate McQuinn um, was serving in the city of Richmond at the time, and we marched across the bridge um, to protest um, safer communities. And so my first public policy was a high school student and full circle now a colleague with Delegate McQuinn. So um, she was there back then to listen um, to all of us and families that came. and. Um, unfortunately, there weren't more people who were willing to listen at the time, um, but we've grown a lot in, in, in our leadership in that area. Um, I think the next um, step for me really um, came when I was in law school. Um, in law school, I started really focusing in the city of Richmond on the area of homelessness and how local policies can prevent nonprofits, specifically churches at the time while I was in law school, from doing more to provide consistent housing. And so a lot of our local governments, um, both city and counties, had made it very difficult for organizations like Caritas and others um, to serve more effectively the homeless. And so I started working in policy centered around affordable housing. And um, that passion for policy about affordable housing continued um, when I became an attorney and I have my own very small practice in Chesterfield County. And I attended lots of local government hearings talking about the segregation of our housing products and that if we are to have better communities, we all must figure out how we all live together regardless of background and income and where you're from and what you have or what you don't have. 
Um, that advocacy at, at one point intersected um, with my church mission work. I ended up volunteering in a um, mainly single female-led housing complex not far from where I live and realized very quickly um, moms were working two, three jobs and could not attend public hearings to advocate for themselves and their children. So I started showing up because I could um, and realized very quickly that intersection of housing and education is where we needed to spend a lot of time, time focusing if we were going to improve the lives of the moms just like me who were doing the best they could by their children, um, but the system just wasn't, wasn't willing to listen to them. Um, so that led me to run for the school board. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, but I ran there and served for two four-year terms representing the Bermuda District, which is home to the entire Jefferson Davis corridor in Chesterfield. Um, and then we, I moved from there and have been serving the House of Delegates for the last two years. Um, on that, I serve on courts of justice. I serve on um, county cities and towns, and I serve on um, public safety. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Chelsea. Hi, good afternoon. So I'm Dr. Chelsea Cosby Morgan. I'm a family practice physician. And what that is, is physician that sees people from birth until death, and also trained in giving birth and delivering babies. At this time, I'm the Deputy Director of Comprehensive Health in the National Office of Women's Health for the Veteran Health Administration. About me, a little more that's, that's different is I'm not an elected official, but I'm here to bring you some information today to help us bridge that disconnect. A lot of people are making policies, but they're not necessarily on the ground. So when I'm delivering babies or when I'm seeing patients, I see where those policies may have left some people hanging. So that's what I want to bring to our conversation today. Not only seeing patients in the classroom, but also throughout my career, I have educated physicians, I've educated nurses, and really a, a lot of that is about health disparities, but also racism in health. Because you may know all of the health disparity information, but if when you contact a patient, you are still perpetuating those things that you were taught in medical school that still cause these health disparities that we're seeing today. So teaching anti-racism to some of our medical students, our resident physicians, and our attending physicians is one of the things that's a big part of my career right now in my, in my role. Good morning. Um, I'm Professor Tanya Scott Hickman, and I'm at the Virginia University. And I guess my first um, introduction to um, disparity, equity, probably one of my favorite Okay. Yes, when I was, when, there we go. All right. So when I was born a, a little black girl and my grandmother and mother instilled in me the importance of community um, involvement and civic engagement from a very young age, um, from church. We did a lot of um, civic projects. I was involved in my communities in both Washington, D.C., and then when I moved here uh, to Richmond, Virginia. My passion is social and economic equity, and um, I, I kind of got that bug um, once I graduated from Virginia, and um, I was appointed to several boards and commissions and realized that when I walked into a room, I was like an anomaly, like a little black girl. Um, and I, I very seldom was heard, you know, I had to fight um, to, to, to be heard, and, and whoever directs the narrative um, is what gets done. And so I understood that my role was to make those issues that aren't heard in those rooms that aren't heard at those tables, um, that it was my, my goal to help every woman, to help every underserved person, to help every community that does not have a voice, to have a voice in, in those areas. And so for me, social um, and economic equity is important. I am so happy to be here to have this conversation um, with all of you all. Um, I work in community development. Um, I'm actually, my role has changed a little bit here at the university. I'm actually the executive director of our community development corporation now. Um, and um, I still teach some courses um, in the Sydney Lewis School of Business. And so I'm looking forward to 
to this conversation and to you all's input and to know what I can do as a practitioner and an educator um, as I help young people move into their, their next challenges in life. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Delegate Hala Ayala, and I'll just jump right on in. You know, when you have lived experiences like mine and you start off in life losing your father to gun violence, and you see what it's like to stand in food lines, wondering how you're gonna make a dollar out of 15 cents, you understand economics very quickly. You understand judgment, you understand representation, you understand what it's like to be a minority child in this world. Um, fast forwarded how I got engaged in policy because I took to all these lived experiences, especially when I decided to have my own child and all the challenges that he faced as an autistic child with a disability and as a black male um, in the school system. I started to volunteer as a PTO president, sit on advisory boards, raise a little hay, um, but I understood the power of representation because not only did I not see parents being able to, to have a uh, you know, seat at the table, but those who looked like my child that were making decisions for my child. And so I wanted to get engaged. I did everything I could, even take off during the day, giving up my own leave, just so I could be a part of the conversation. Uh, later on, when Barack Obama came to Prince William County, when I heard, yes, you can, those words just resonated with me and my family because I took that seriously. He talked about pay inequity. He talked about the need for equal part work, for equal pay, the need for representation. And in 2008, he was on the precipice of becoming the first black man president. And that just spoke to me. I needed to hear that. Um, took my advocacy on to talk and champion these policies, not only knocking doors for parent, for uh, colleagues that are now serving, but also up and down the, the Democratic ticket because I believed in all of these values. You know, when you talk to individuals that are voting and everyday citizens, they want what you want, success, opportunity, hope, what's for tomorrow, right? And that we're all working for the same cause. Um, as a National Organization for Women advocate, not being able to see what you can be was a challenge to me. So I took on feminism, being the first minority woman to, to, to start a chapter in my district, um, to talk about these issues that are intersectional to all women, not just some women, but all. So women are part of this country, 51% of the demographic, and I wanted the seat at the table versus being on the menu. So today I'm with you today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I'm with you today to talk about this powerful intersectional conversation about women. And thank you for the opportunity because this is a powerful opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to apologize to Dr. Chelsea Cosby Morgan. I, my timer went off and I did not uh, share with the panelists. I'm going to start timing you now. Um, and you did not go over. So don't, I don't want that to be out in the, the universe. Um, what I will do is that we'll ask that you don't clap after everyone. If you like something that they say doing it, you can please let them know and let us know. Uh, but we want to be able to get as much time as possible hearing from them. And so I'm just going to share with you that I am going to now begin to time each of you two minutes uh, for your <laughs> responses. And um, if it won't be intrusive, either I can do my hand up or you'll hear the little jingle, but it's, you know, it's time to, to wrap. Is that okay? We're, we're good. So, now that we're going to the lightning round, could you please tell me how you will promote gender and racial equity in the work that you do, and how do you believe these issues face women and people of color? I will start with the Honorable. Hala Ayala. Thank you for that question. Um, I think I will just continue on with this introduction that I gave because when I came to the General Assembly, I came there to pass the Equal Rights Amendment, to expand Medicaid, to talk about paid family medical leave, to work with my colleagues who had been fighting before I got there. 
And for the women that were groundbreakers, I just want to say thank you. Because again, you opened the door. Just because you're the first, let's not be the last. And so I appreciate that opportunity. Secondly, we passed the Equal Rights Amendment. These are policy, this policy in codifying the ability not only to vote, but have access to resources, again, like paid family medical leave, health care, and all of the necessary resources that help us to thrive. Um, you know, this session, I was proud to champion the Infant Fetal Mortality Review Team, which talks about the disparities and within black and brown women, why death rates among women during the process of childbirth from, from postpartum to, to, you know, from the beginning of our pregnancies, uh, why are we dying at higher rates? So this uh, infant fetal mortality team is historic. It is working very hard to, to collect this data and build policy off of that. So these are the steps that we're taking in the General Assembly, um, as well as raising minimum wage. We know that, you know, if I'm a black woman, I'm making 56 cents on the dollar, a Latina, you know, 65, a white woman, 78. We need to have equal work for equal pay, and this means equity in all of our systems. So thank you. Thank you. Also, I'm going to now uh, turn to Delegate Kohlner, and so you can answer that question as well. Wonderful. Um, you know, an area, as I said in my introduction, I'm extremely pas passionate about is public education. And uh, that is an area we have a lot of work to do. Our public education system is not set up to give every child who enters it the same fair shot. And we have a lot of work to do to ensure that we're starting with our youngest learners with their early childhood education and that we are giving everyone a pathway where they can choose uh, what they want to do when they leave pre-K through 12. Um, some of the work I started in, and thankfully a lot of colleagues, female colleagues who are here, um, worked with me in a bipartisan way on SOL reform. You know, we have a system that is set up and in place to give our children a high stakes test at the end of their third grade and beyond years. And we give them this high stakes test and we've been giving teachers data that that teacher no longer has that child in their classroom and therefore that teacher cannot change anything for that student when they're leaving. Um, we passed legislation this last year that um, shifts for our third through eighth graders in reading and math starting in 2024 eliminating that high stakes test and replacing it with growth assessments. So that as parents and as educators and as children, we can see at the beginning of a school year where every individual child starts with us, we can journey with them to see how they're growing or where they need more help, and then we can see at the end of the year their areas of strength and weakness. So we will no longer be telling our children and teachers you have failed or you have passed. It will be where are you growing and where do you need more supports throughout the Commonwealth to ensure that all children are growing? So the amount of information we're getting ready to have um, is huge for our schools, but that's just third through eighth grade reading and math, right? That's just a p small piece of what's been broken. So I'm going to continue working um, this upcoming year focusing on early literacy. COVID really highlighted for us our already broken early literacy system, but pathways forward um, to build a more um, stable future for our youngest learners. Thank you so much. Professor Scott Hickman. So my passion um, is around workforce and workforce development. And during this whole COVID pandemic for the last 18 months, women um, were the most disproportionately affected by it. Losing 4.3 million jobs, 2.3 million have left the workforce because they had to take care of children who were not in school. Um, they are the primary caretakers in their immediate and extended families. And so the issues of work and life balance need to be discussed. Uh, we need to have legislation around that. Um, economic stability, pay equity, opportunities for advancement, um, discrimination very much still exists, of course, in the workforce. Um, the pay gap, as many of us have, have already mentioned, paid and unpaid leave, um, and just being able to juggle all of the things that, that women juggle in their daily lives. Um, many of society's issues and isms are disproportionately heaped on the backs and shoulders of women, and in particular, black women um, and women of other races and ethnicities. And then women with disabilities, we often leave that segment of women out. 
um, when we talk about workforce and workforce development, but um, they have been most affected um, by this COVID um, pandemic. Um, in a recent study, February 21st study from the Institute for Women's Policy Research, the three major issues that women wanted to address um, on the national level were healthcare, the economic recession, and unemployment. And we are still last to go back to work. We are still at the lower uh, rung of the pay scales. And all of those issues need to be addressed immediately because uh, women are suffering at a much higher rate than anyone else um, in the country. And it not only affects um, us financially, but it affects our mental well-being and our health. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now we're going to start with Delegate Adams. Thank you. Um, as uh, <clears throat> my colleague Delegate Ayala mentioned, we've, we've done a lot of work, but there's so much work to do. I really do focus on health care policy a lot. I am the only uh, clinician practicing medical clinician in the House. I'm one of only three in the General Assembly. I feel like having that lens on the ground is critical. Um, I, I have almost always practiced in underserved communities, and I can tell you as my uh, new uh, colleague that I've just met, uh, Dr. Morgan has mentioned, racism is definitely alive and well in the healthcare system, as is sexism. Um, I, I do think it's important uh, going forward. I mean, we've done great things. We, we've done introduced tele telemedicine, which is very helpful. Uh, expanded scope of practice for certified nurse midwives, uh, gotten reimbursement pathways for doulas, things where, you know, people of color in particular want to see people of color uh, helping take care of them. And that's really important. And there's a dearth of healthcare providers, definitely a workforce shortage, specifically uh, of people of color. But in general, there's a workforce shortage. In healthcare, though, there are all kinds of challenges. There is health literacy, which is a problem. Um, that's among patients, but amongst providers, there is definitely a lack of real conversation about racism. And racism is a, is a subject that is very difficult to talk to between races anymore. Uh, we've become so divisive, it's become so charged, and it's really, really important that we build alliances and bridges, which is what this is about. This is very critical that we're able to have these conversations safely, uh, and, and that we can have those conversations to eradicate some of this racism. Some of it is just uh, you know, they talk about unintended consequences. I think, um, you know, a lot of a lot of racism is 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 really due to a lack of awareness that there, that it's even a real thing. And I think uh, people are shocked when they hear something like that. But I, I I think it's a real it's really important to understand that many people who are Caucasian uh, don't understand what it means uh, to to experience racism. And so it is incumbent upon us to have dialogues in safe ways that really highlights this without being accusatory, which I think, you know, this is the conversation that needs to have to heal us. Thank you. Dr. Chelsea Morgan. Um, so first I did wanna say as a part of my introduction, um, even though I'm working for the VA today, I am here on my own, so I'm not representing the VA with my comments. <laughs> um, but uh, the biggest thing that I have done for, for equity and that I continue to do is ask for the numbers. And that's something I would encourage you all to do as well. Some people will like to throw data out at you, but one thing we can all ask for is the numbers. And when I say that, Facebook can gather all this data on us. Facebook has all of this data, but why don't some of these health systems have the same data? The question is, why do some of the people report stuff by gender, and then they report stuff by ethnicity? But when you ask, what is the African-American woman number, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. So what happens is we get numbers that show women, and we get numbers that show gender and ethnicity separately. But as we know with maternal mortality rates, as we know with infant mortality rates, as we know with COVID vaccine rates, as we know with breast cancer rates, black women have a completely different situation. So we need to push for these numbers. And so I'm asking for those in my healthcare systems. You have to ask for numbers when we talk about workforce. Any state funded place so I went to UVA. What are the African American women numbers that you are enrolling? How many people are you interviewing? So one of the issues, people talk about pipelines. We need, we need more doctors, right? Pipelines start with elementary school. But what if I told you a lot of black women graduated from medical school, but they could not get into a residency? Mm. So that means there's people out there who are ready to serve you, 
And the data is there. The data is not fully fledged out on whether or not people do better with a black doctor. But guess what? A black newborn has a 39% increase in making it through their first year of life if they have a black doctor. So we do know that. So we need to push for these numbers. Thank you. Next series of questions. COVID-19 has disproportionately <laughs> impacted the economic power of women. Why aren't women returning to work and what are the short-term and long-term ramifications of this phenomenon? Delegate Courtney. We were sitting out in the hallway before this, the panelists, we were having a conversation about COVID and the impact on women. Um, you know, we saw when COVID hit and on March 13th, I will never forget the day, all of our children were sent home from school and I had to figure it out, just like a whole lot of other women in our community. We all had to figure it out, but it really showed women who had um, systems around them in place that could support them and women who did not. And, you know, I'm very fortunate that I have two sisters that live within five miles of me and between the three of us, we figured it out. Um, not everyone has those support systems. And COVID really highlighted when, um, you know, it is a lot harder, I think we all know now than we thought, for children to attend school virtually in your house while you try to work. It's kind of a joke because you really can't, especially if you have younger children, work efficiently and help your child do virtual learning. So we saw a lot of women who made the decision for their children to not work. And then it became very difficult to get back into um, jobs that they had because people had filled those roles with either other people or had figured out how to do without. And I've heard from a lot of women, we're in door knocking season right now in Virginia. And one of the topics at the door with a lot of women is the fact that they're not sure what to do now. That really COVID highlighted for them that the job that they had really isn't there anymore. Um, it doesn't make sense for their household. And there's this underlying fear that their child will come back home, right? We'll be back into virtual learning. So there's tr this trepidation about, well, what do I do? Because my, like all of us as mothers, our children need us. So it has had a huge impact on women, and I think it really compounded um, the problems and highlighted areas that we as communities need to figure out why are there systems in place in certain communities, like childcare opportunities that were available for certain mothers, and in other communities there was no childcare to be found. Delegate Ayala. I was really uh, taking mental notes about this because I remember my lived experience. You know, inequities that we are seeing with COVID and the disproportionate impacts to black and brown communities already existed. And I, I have to be honest, sometimes I get confused when they say, you know, COVID exacerbated this because we were already exhausted. It's just now visible to everyone. <laughs> so please forgive me. You know, this, when we talk about economics, the, the she session and the ability for, and the way we're, you know, all of these inequities isn't just about, you know, what can we do to fix it, but what is broken? When we talk about getting a job and being not judged by the name that's on your paper or your, your, your physical appearance. I remember a woman, her name was Claudia Covington. I was one of my summer school jobs, my first administrative job. And a, a sister, she said to me, she said, she brought me into the room and she said, Hala, what you wear and the clothes that you bring is your calling card, your business card. And I didn't understand, but I was in there with baggy jeans and Timberlands and a t-shirt. I thought I was pretty hip, you know, to be working in the summer school as an administrator. But she clearly told me, we are women, especially women of color, are judged first, seen first, and heard last. And she gave me a gift card because she knew my economic situation and told me to go change my clothes. <laughs> But the beauty about that is I take Claudia with me. When we're talking about what COVID is, representation matters. That's what she was speaking to the heart of. 
So as we are looking at our elected officials to help us navigate this pandemic, yes ma'am, I'm gonna hurry up, it, it's important to not only have the support infrastructure, but the representation. It does matter. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Scott Hickman. So I have to agree with the Honorable Ayala. Um, I think everything that everyone has already said um, is, is, is part of the whole picture and part of the problem. I think we've just had studies, um, we studied the studies, um, and the needle remains unmoved. And so I think just getting right down to it, what it is is systemic racism and sexism. Um, and the problem is that our society simply does not value women like they value men. Um, our society does not value people of color like they value white people. Um, and they still will still mired in these old opinions and stereotypes and mindsets about what women should do, can't do, would do, don't want to do. Um, and I, I just believe that, that and, and, and especially in the workforce, um, that that's just the issue. It's, it's simply that. I think we all know what needs to be done. There's been a lot of policy to try to help women and to try to um, um, include women and to be more inclusive, and it just has not happened as fast as it should. And so how you change mindsets, I have no idea. But that's, that's really what needs to happen on a large scale. Thank you. Delegate Adams. Thank you. Well, I, I certainly um, agree with all of those comments. I think, you know, what I've seen in, I have a, my own business, uh, and what I see is that, you know, people, are, their anxiety levels have just skyrocketed. And, and, and that is actually irrespective of color. It, it, it is uh, become, a, the last two years have been incredibly traumatic for everyone. I think, you know, when we talk about exacerbating a problem, uh, that is also true. Um, you know, you can look at the research, you can look at some numbers. You, I also, in my own clinical experience, know that w women and people of color generally have more chronic illnesses that have been unaddressed over time. Uh, when you have chronic illness, uh, that puts you at risk for any kind of situation that comes along like a virus, right? And so uh, when, then there is just a, a trickle down effect of everything because when you're concerned about your own health, uh, and then you're concerned about should you go back to your place of employment, that also becomes a factor now because people don't feel protected, they don't feel safe, we've gotten too much misinformation, we've gotten wrong information about the vaccines, uh, you know, and we've just done, uh, frankly, I, I feel on a national level, a terrible job of communicating the value and, and, and the actual um, validity of our vaccine. Uh, so, you know, this is not something that they just pulled out of a hat somewhere. Uh, there are decades of research behind the technology to create the vaccine. So we, we've, we've really done a disservice to communities uh, by not having coordinated and, and positive and good information. Uh, but, but people need to feel safe to go back to work. And they need to feel that their children are safe. And they need to feel that um, there, there's a risk benefit or a return on investment to going back to work and to finding a job that actually pays them enough to get childcare and that we have childcare you know, supports. All of these things are intersectional, uh, but, but they all make up reasons. I think the reasons why people aren't going back to work are complicated and sort of uh, you know, align with all of the things that have, have been brought up today. Thank you. Dr. Cosby Morgan. Um, so with COVID, I. We, a lot of people are talking about social determinants of health, and I think that is a huge issue. And I just wanted to talk a little more about what that is. So when I see a patient and I'm talking to them about resting and taking their pills and eating right and exercising, I can't follow them home. So I can't go home with them and make sure that they can rest, but they don't have sick leave. I can't go home with them and make sure they eat right, but there's no grocery store. I can't go with them and ask them to walk, but it's dangerous to walk in their neighborhood or they don't have any facilities to exercise. So that's what we mean by social determinants of health. So here in Richmond, we know that there's clear, um, clear connections between certain communities and their life expectancy. If you live in Gilpin Court, life expectancy around 2015 was 63. If you live in Westover Hills, right over the bridge, 83. So if you live in two different communities in the same city, 20 year difference is huge. And some people may say, well, it's the demographic makeup because black people may have higher risk of this than that. Well, if you look at African-American women in the metro area, so that's Chesterfield, Henrico, Richmond, African-American women, they have a 27% chance of having high blood pressure. If you look at East Richmond, 53. 
So that's, both are African American women. It's two different areas. So now that COVID has happened, it's unmasked that, and now we have to do something about it because we know high blood pressure, diabetes, cancer, all those makes you high risk for COVID. So it's allowing us to have fuel to the fire. It's not right that we're just now paying attention, but we do have to ride this wave. If this is what we have to talk about in order to get it done, we have to talk about it now. So when we talk about health disparities and social determinants of health, that's one of the foundations as we continue our discussion about maternal mortality and vaccines and some of these other things today. That's kind of the foundation of that. Okay, thank you so much. We're now going to turn to talk about issues uh, of the economy as well. The Commonwealth earned the top slot in CNBC's 2021 ranking of America's best states for business, boasting a strong workforce and the solid educational system. But how does this impact all of the community and the women as it relates to uh, communities of color? I'm gonna open it up and whoever would like to respond to that You'll have two minutes. I'll start. So what I teach here at Virginia Union is um, entrepreneurship. And I'm a proponent of women and minorities owning their own enterprises. The issue there is, again, access to the things you need to grow and scale a business which of course, number one is capital and the lack thereof of access um, from traditional funding sources. Banks do not give um, minorities and women, they, they are declined business loans at much higher rates than, than other um, ethnicities. The support of starting and building businesses in, in underserved communities is not where it needs to be. There are a lot of services that are not in communities. We talk about food insecurity because there are no stores, there are no um, opportunities for, the, um, um, for, for persons to start enterprises in African-American communities. So I think that um, the economy, a lot of people had to, I mean, a story about furlough cheesecake. I don't know if anybody knows that. They're in the National Harbor, so there were two women that um, were laid off during COVID, and they had to pivot their whole lives because, you know, they were um, they were in, in corporate America, and they had been there for many, many years. Well, one of them made really good cheesecakes, and so they just decided, okay, we're going to start the cheesecake because we got to make ends meet somehow. Um, they were afforded um, some money through the CARES Act, which, which has been very helpful. Um, it has not gotten to African-American communities on the scale that it should have, um, um, and, and small businesses. I think the last round helped more small businesses than the first two, but um, those are the types of things, um, on, when we talk about economics, that I think we need to think about is small business development um, in African American Thank you. I'll jump in. Um, you know, we also have to talk about the racial disparity in vaccination rates. We can't even begin this conversation until we make sure that our workforce is not only protected, but healthy. This means access to affordable health care, reproductive health care, screenings, all the essentials that impact not just women of color, but all women. Um, when we're talking about this she session and getting back to work and how we can rise above the already challenges that we were already facing, um, we're to get, we have to also talk about universal child care and elder care. We have to talk about broadband access. Um, we have to talk about opportunities in our SWAM businesses and entrepreneurship, right? <coughs> we have to support our SWAM businesses. We are, have done disparity studies in these areas and we are taking action in the General Assembly. Um, we are talking about our reproductive health care and protecting those measures as well as our health care. However, we have 700,000 Virginians who don't have access to affordable health care and 100,000 children that still need it. Um, so all of this, especially for women, economics is, I don't know, right up there with every other factor that we are facing in our day to day. I remember as a parent, I had to choose, even we're talking about you know, prescription drugs for my son who needed access to life-saving measures, I had to choose whether to pay my rent 
or pay for my prescription. Again, it always hits us right in the pocket. And our determinants aren't just about we'll go to work sick, we'll do everything we can because we don't have the essential workforce and infrastructure to help us along the way. And people will tell me along the, the campaign trail, well, this is a handout. And I say, no, it's a hand up. I've been on public assistance not once but twice in my life, and I know how hard it is. I'm the exception and not the rule. So we also have to change the narrative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just want to remind you that we'll give you the opportunity for the audience to uh, become a part of this conversation. Please uh, write your questions down and uh, hold them up and someone will bring them up to me so that you can get the questions that you want answered. I'm going to turn it to the uh, area of education. We now all know in our nation that education is the great equalizer, but whether or not that is true for everyone. So I'll start by asking Delegate Corner, research indicates that women make up the majority of lower paying jobs. So what educational opportunities most op must open to reverse this trend and how can policy help us do this? Thank you. Uh, I think, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of things. First, uh, we have a big problem with early literacy in our commonwealth. Um, our early literacy system is broken, and I, I'm going to duck a little when I say our higher education institutions play a role in that. They play a really big role in that. You know, we've gotten into a habit with colleges and universities of wanting to be proprietary on our reading practices or on our how we're teaching our educators to do math versus saying what's the science of reading and how does that translate to what's best for all classroom teachers and therefore all children. So, you know, we all have a part to play in that backbone of early literacy because what you will see, because we do have data on our children and what's been happening, those gaps keep widening more and more and more. And what our data shows is that white male students tend to predominantly do better and better and better in opportunities throughout school. And if you go backwards and you stop focusing on that success rate at the end, it starts at the beginning. So it starts on what the foundations that our children had in their communities. And that early literacy is key. If you are not reading on grade level by third grade, you are expected to be able to shift from learning to read to reading to learn. Well, if you're still trying to learn to read, you are behind at that moment in time and it continues. And you know, when you look at the rates of our students getting into the best high school specialty centers and the best governor schools, it goes back in time for what was available for our children in elementary and middle school. And so the foundation of that for women is really going back and saying, what are we doing in pre-K through second grade so that they have the highest chance for success and then demanding that we look at our standards of quality and we fund our schools for what positions are really necessary to teach and allow every child to grow in Virginia. Thank you. Next question is about uh, the environment. How important is environmental issues uh, to the Commonwealth? We perhaps have become more and more conscious after in the aftermath of the Flint, Michigan case. But here in the Commonwealth, there has also been issues of food deserts, high rates of asthma. And so I'm going to ask Delegate Adams, what are some other environmental issues that can be addressed through policy? Thank you. Um, you know, when, I, when we're out knocking doors, envir environment and the climate crisis is, is in the top three issues that people care about. And they care about it because it's, uh, it's our future. Um, if we are going to uh, reduce uh, the trajectory of the climate crisis, we have to do something now or we'll, we'll absolutely be unable to sort of halt the progression. Um, part of that is uh, related to carbon emissions and one of the things that we can do is uh, work with localities uh, to understand the importance of working together for better transportation systems so that we have a transportation infrastructure that potentially lets us reduce um, the number of cars on the road. Um, we absolutely have to have uh, better standards for um, how we are protecting our air, uh, water, and land, uh, just generally speaking. So we have to look in, at the whole approach towards uh, how we are doing that and what are common sense solutions. I think in the city, one of the things that 
is a very like niche issue, but is important is that we, in addition to having food deserts in places, we also have heat uh, zones. These heat zones are, um, you know, I don't know if you've looked around, I've lived in Richmond for 25 years. One of the things that really bothers me is how incredibly ugly all the apartments are that are going up. But not only are they ugly, uh, they're a missed opportunity for, um, for an in inclusion of environmental protection. I mean, little things like trees, uh, plants, uh, ways to create and beautify also help the environment because um, they're you know, helping reduce the CO2. So I, I think we can do big things and small things through policy, but I definitely think uh, w some of this is local. Bigger issues have to do with you know, uh, our stormwater system. You know, we've put a lot of money into that. There's so much more that needs to be done. Just two weeks or three weeks ago, we had massive floods in the streets uh, all around the city. And uh, you know, it's just kind of inexcusable that we are not paying more attention to our infrastructure because ultimately that affects everything. It affects the James River. It affects er everything about you know, how we're engaging with our environment. So I think there are many, many things we can do, but there are also very simple things we could do, and we should do them. Thank you, Dr. Cosby Morgan. So we mentioned social determinants of health and how a lot of that is linked to your environment, water, air. So that has a direct connection with the health of people in Richmond and everywhere. But there's something else I wanted to bring up. I would like to see Virginia bring something forth similar to California's Proposition 65. And what that is is for decades, California has required that all chemicals, whether you're cleaning your house, you're putting it on your body, you're putting it in your hair, they're requiring that you label it if it has something that could cause birth defects, if it has something that could cause cancer or have other reproductive harm. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because not only is it something we should do because we clearly know about these chemicals, but black women have a higher risk of these things. We already talked about it's Breast Cancer Awareness Month, we're wearing our pink, but what else are we doing to prevent breast cancer? So when they've done studies, and some of you all may see these shampoos that say paraben-free, silicone-free. It's not just a trend. A lot of these chemicals are linked to things that disrupt your hormones. And black women versus white women have different levels in their bodies, and they're assuming it's because of the chemicals that we're putting on our bodies. They tested urine. Black women had 78% higher levels of phthalate in their urine than white women. They looked at children, regardless of the gender, black children had four times more parabens in their urine than white children. So I'm sure a lot of us would cut these things out if we knew what we were putting on our bodies. And I think our government and our, our servants can help us do that by labeling things. So I would like to see that happen. Yes. I also just want to build off the conversations that we've had. Um, I don't know if you all have seen that the General Assembly has taken action to reduce carbon emissions uh, by 2050 by putting us back into REGI, the Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Also, we passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which I was proud to be a patron on that bill. But we also fought for equities within legislation, meaning that if, you know, for different housing communities, especially communities of color, we talked about the imbalances of, of you know, affordability to the, you know, solar, um, et cetera. So, this is the floor, not the ceiling, beginning of these conversations. But again, representation matters. You know, I can't stress that enough. And as you look towards policies and things we can do, not only from a community advocacy, advocacy standpoint, but it's about the legislators and people making the laws within your state, as well as the federal level, that are impacting our communities the most. So my mother was a firm believer. You have two ears and one mouth. That means talk less, listen more. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm going to shift now to some questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, and um, you can uh, answer whoever feels uh, comfortable. How do we push to access the medical data and access to medical support from foundations? Um, so I think with medical data, when you have that information from the government or, you know, like I'm saying, I work for the VA or some of these different places, you can go to people who are in leadership there or communicate with your patient advocates. So let's say you're going to Johnson Willis or St. Francis, your patient advocate, that is your, your way into places in order to get your voice heard. 
a lot of places have boards. So their boards run these nonprofits or different organizations. And you can also challenge those people to say, what are your numbers for this or that? Um, this is really important because some places may have a higher rate of medical racism. We may find out once we get the numbers how many people are being turned away or have poor outcomes or more people die, die there. So if we don't know the numbers, we won't be able to hold them accountable. So that's why I really think we should ask. And then in terms of enrollment, education, employment, anything that, that our government is contracting with, our government should have those numbers. So if they're contracting with whatever company to provide a service, they should be able to show you what are the numbers for the number of black women that are employed there, what is the salary for the black women employed there, not just the average salary, because the average could be 20, and white men could be making 23, and black women could be making 17. Mm -hmm. So if we are putting our taxpayer dollars towards these companies to provide us services, we should be able to ask for that information from our representatives. Thank you. Okay. Next question is that COVID has taken us by a storm. There was always problems in nursing care facilities, lack of CNAs, lack of care, leaving patients, in, leaving patients unattended for long periods of time. With that being said, how do we change that system? Because too many patients have died during this pandemic due to this problem, and much help is needed. I'd be happy to talk to you. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think I'm a member of the Joint uh, Commission on Healthcare, and, and particularly, uh, you know, the aging, and, and, and we're looking at nursing facilities in particular in that committee. I think, um, you know, what we have seen come to light, uh, like many things, uh, is something that's been well known in the uh, healthcare community, and particularly the nursing, nursing home community, is that there is a staffing problem. Uh, that is a big part of it. We're starting to really, um, I think, finally focus on the fact that there are not enough providers per people. Uh, I think also, uh, you know, just an awareness that, um, uh, you know, n the whole nursing home situation should not be where we aspire. It should be the last resort for most people. And so we, what we really have to focus on, and I think it's, it's an emergency because uh, what we're, we're going to see is from 2010 to 2030 in Virginia, our uh, population over 65 is going to double. Uh, we don't have an infrastructure to support aging in place, much less uh, to support people in nursing facilities, which are not optimal environments in any way. So, uh, you know, one of the things we are focused on and I, I am very passionate about is creating infrastructure and supports around aging in place, which is why, you know, understanding things like the social determinants of health, understanding that you have to have access to food, transportation, medical care, you have to have, uh, you know, places to live that are accessible and safe. Uh, you have to make accommodations for people to remain in their environment. These are all important pieces of coming up with, okay, here's the problem, now what are some of the solutions? I think we have solutions that are possibilities, leveraging technology, leveraging community. But one of the biggest things that I think is really, really critical is we have got to find a path back to loving each other as a community and stop focusing on our own individual benefits. This is going to kill us as a society. I, I think it is the number one thing that we need to do for many of these problems is start building back communities because it, it, it's going to bankrupt us financially, but I think it's going to bankrupt us morally more. Hmm. Thank you so very much. Another question, and this comes from Katherine Haynes from Chesterfield County Midlothian representative from the Public School Board. What state policies do you think we need, do you think need to be changed to bring more gender and racial equity to public education? I'll go. <laughs> um, you know, there was an article in the paper this morning about Maggie Walker Governor's School and the discrepancy amongst black children being accepted at the high school level. And I was watching all the comments of people. And what really impacted me was 10 years ago on the Chesterfield County School Board, I brought up the exact issue. The exact issue because I represented the largest number of minority children in the county and they weren't getting to go to Appomattox Regional or Maggie Walker and when I started to undo the why right because we ask questions so that we can get information so we can figure out what's happening the why really backed up to middle school I found out in my middle schools because I had so many children behind in reading and math 
that they were teaching double English and double math to so many children, they didn't have enough teachers to give the children who were capable of advanced courses the opportunity to take an advanced course. They were cutting things that you needed to get into more advanced programs like world languages. They were cutting things like band and orchestra in order to put more children in more basic reading and math. And so that made it where you didn't have the same opportunity than if you went to a school across the other side of town and they offered you six world languages, every elective you could think of, every opportunity to have double accelerated math starting in fourth grade, and we didn't have any double accelerated math at all, which meant if you were in fourth grade in my community, there was no pathway for you to get to Maggie Walker if you wanted to. You could do everything you could. There was no course lineup possible for you to get there. So the opportunities for our kids, again, it goes back to elementary school. We have to give the foundations to every single child in our communities for what they need to have the exact same opportunities and choices as any other child, whether it is because of the color of your skin, if you have a disability, if you are a boy, a girl, we owe it to every child to have their own individualized education set up for them so that they have the opportunity to be just as successful as any other child in this state. Thank you. Anyone else want to address that? I am biting my tongue because, <laughs> choose your words. Um, you know, I agree with equity and opportunity but it comes down to, with me, as a woman of color, talking about my black children to a non-diverse school board, that... I say this with love, because if you've not walked in the shoes, you don't know how they fit. And when I was advocating for my son and my daughter, my daughter was an academic, she, would, she graduated with honors, she, but there was still disparity. And then talking, about, talking with teachers who did not understand her plight, her challenges, and I say this, when we talk about equity inclusion, we must promote having black and brown teachers in our schools. We must empower them, education opportunities, and I'm gonna say the quiet part out loud. This is not political. Policy is our lives. It impacts us on every level. So it's important that people understand the impact to our families. Having a balanced conversation, meaning representation, in the areas in which these decisions are being made. I was on a PTO board where I watched not only teachers take money out of their pockets to supply the tools and resources they need, they had to go to a second job. And they, can, they did, were not able to stay at home with my son, and, and, or me as a mom, could not get off of work to go sit on that parent-teacher conference. I think this is a big conversation, not just only about representation, but when we talk about compassion and love and understanding, we must understand where we have come from and where we need to go. Thank you so much. Next question is from Aurora Higgs from the Virginia LT, LGBTQ Advisory Board. What kinds of legislative tactics can we use to uplift health disparities among black trans women in the Commonwealth? Could, could you repeat that question again? What kinds of legislative tactics can we use to uplift health disparities among black trans women in the Commonwealth? Well, first, we know that black trans women are less likely to live till they're 40 years old. This means that our, our LGBTQ, this includes our trans brothers and sisters, our need to be a part of this com comprehensive conversation about policies as we're going into the, to the General Assembly. And I speak from my hat of being a lawmaker. We took action by removing discriminatory laws in our housing system for all individuals. Again, 
It's not some, it's not just us, it has to be all of us. And we have to look at the lens through uh, conversations, having those hard conversations about, you know, not just about the implementation of policy, but who it impacts. And then ask the questions of those communities, how can we help more? What can we do more and how we can do better? Um, being a legislator has taught me, and I've learned this through the wisdom and lens of my veteran legislators, that although we'd like to think we are all knowing, it takes a village to create change. And that means having conversations and being earnest about what you do and do not know. I am not the subject matter expert, um, but I am trying and I do want to try to do better. So I would encourage engagement with your elected officials. I would encourage having those conversations and what we can do to do better because I think we all want the same thing and that's opportunity, being able to thrive and persevere and be successful. Thank you. Um, so one thing we did do this year that, that helps to uplift the, especially the older community, and I, I introduced this bill, actually, a delegate Coiner, a uh, chief co-patron this bill, was expanding the Older Americans Act that includes uh, to make sure that we are uh, speaking to people who are members of the LGBT and HIV positive community so that they are actually seen and offered services because uh, those type of disparities often are disparities of, 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 of a lack of being seen and a lack of trust for the system. So I think that, you know, that was one important piece. Um, I, I do think also though, you know, there are some unique issues. You know, when we know better as a society, we have often done better, not always. Um, and one of the things that we know is that uh, for, for trans women, especially trans women of color, uh, they are particularly vulnerable to um, uh, death and murder, uh, uh, murder-based death, but also suicide. Um, and many of these things start with things like housing, um, a safe place to rest your head, a safe place from which to operate, a safe place from which to seek things like uh, healthcare and, and a job. And so part of what we need to do as lawmakers is, is include, uh, you know, representation from the trans women of color community in positions where they can be heard to find out, you know, what are the issues in ways that people understand. And then secondarily, really, really understand what is working in other communities, in other states, in other places so that we can model best practice uh, as we move forward, because this is often a balance of resources, and so we need to be able to, you know, look at if there are benchmarks to do better. But I think the m number one thing we need to do is include people um, that that are for the for whom this is affecting into the decision making process. Thank you. I I would add um, to that we also passed legislation. Um, having served on the courts committee, Delegate Rome brought forward legislation that removed the affirmative dis defense of someone coming forward and saying, well, I was so surprised that they weren't the sex that I thought they were, that I hurt them, killed them, harmed them, and we removed that in Virginia as an affirmative defense. And so that was extremely important legislation as well. Thank you. And one of the major health inequities that are impacting trans women, especially black trans women, is HIV. And I wanted to bring that up because it's not just black trans women, but cis women as well. So women who are born and identify as women who are African American still have high rates of HIV. So when we talk about HIV, it is known that in neighborhoods that have high rates of incarceration, people have male, male partners that may be incarcerated when they return, we have higher rates of HIV with their female partners. So, you know, a lot of stuff starts with housing, but it also continues with stuff that we do already know. We have the research, we have the evidence, what are we doing to address that? Well, there's one solution, we can give people PrEP and we can make that easily available. Well, what is PrEP? PrEP is a daily pill that can reduce HIV. If someone comes in contact with someone who has HIV, whether it's through needles or through sexual contact, if you've been taking PrEP every day, your risk is reduced by 90%. So we may be able to remove HIV. I mean, I'm hopeful that we can get rid of it, but this is the issue. We're talking about social determinants of health and a lot of our trans black women are low income. Guess how much PrEP costs? PrEP costs $2,000 a month. Wow. 
So we have to figure out how much is a life worth? We have to figure out how much is a black life worth, how much is a black woman's life, and how much is a black trans woman's life worth? Because if we can make sure that PrEP is paid for, whether it's giving it to our, our brothers who are incarcerated, our sisters who are incarcerated, or people when they come back into the community and everyone in those communities that have high rates, we may be able to get rid of HIV. Thank you. Uh, Professor Scott Hickman, what is being done to create job training opportunities for students who cannot afford to attend college? And how is this being communicated to the community? So the WIOIA Act, the Workforce Opportunities and Investment Act, um, that I believe initially um, was enacted in 2016, then uh, was reenacted again in maybe 2018 or so, is probably the foremost program on the federal level that um, assist young people. Um, there are various programs. There may be young people, uh, myself and Ms. Cosby worked in a program where we assisted 16 to 24 year olds um, who were out of school, meaning that they either did not finish high school, uh, they may have finished high school, but did not go on to any other higher education or training. Um, and so that is the, the largest public policy um, program addressing workforce development. Um, and, and there is, if you do not know, there, there is a workforce office in each locality. Um, and so I do think that getting the word out about those programs and opportunities is, has been a struggle, um, I know. And also being able to keep young people involved to where they can get some kind of certification. So certifications are important um, when you maybe don't have a college um, degree. Um, having a, a, an industry certification will put you at a different income level as you go out into to the workforce. Um, and a lot of that is unknown. The um, Office of Community Wealth Building here in the city of Richmond um, runs that um, WIOIA program. We, WIOIA is the acronym um, for the Workforce um, Investment Act. And so um, here at Virginia Union, we have a workforce development office that we specifically um, um, give opportunities for young people to gain work experience, to get certifications um, in STEM areas, in business areas, Six Sigma and things like that. And so I think that we need to let young people know that there are other ways to enter the workforce successfully because everybody may not want to go to college. Everybody doesn't have the finances to go to college. Everybody just does not, um, college does not work for everyone. And, and so there, there are other ways that young people can successfully be a part of the workforce. Let me get to a question in an area that we have not uh, asked, and this comes from Reverend Sharon Brodus, and it is to uh, all of our delegates. In our judicial system, when a black person commits a crime, and a white person commits the same crime, why do blacks get more time served? And what would you do to change it? That's, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that we are doing now, and, and is really critical, uh, the a main job that the General Assembly has is appointing judges. And uh, you know who we appoint for judges has a lot to do with the sentencing practices. When we appoint people who reflect the community and the community that they're serving, I think we have better opportunities and more fairness and justice for all people. You know, we have to appoint judges who see people as people and know that people make mistakes. And that mistake has brought them to a very scary place. And there is no reason that we have to treat people with less dignity. There is a system for reform and, and for you know serving out a sentence. But we, we need to have people that understand what that looks like. I would like to see us give more power back to judges once we have better judges where there aren't mandatory minimums. <laughs> Uh, for every little thing because you know one of the power of being a uh, part of the power of being a judge is having the experience uh, and the knowledge to know how you know the punishment fits the crime and we we, we need to not have um, 
take, take away that power. I think there has been uh, some good parts to that because judges weren't always uh, necessarily fair. But I think as we are becoming a stronger Virginia, a more fair Virginia, uh, a Virginia that cares about who our judges are, uh, that, that this is something that is going to be an important piece is that judges have the ability to take and look at the whole situation of the person who's experienced a crime and make decisions uh, based on their experiential knowledge and the experience of that person. Thank you. I can uh, chime in. I am glad Delegate Adams brought up our judges because for the first time in history, we have diverse judges representing, the most diverse judges representing our Commonwealth. Again, this is the floor, not the ceiling. There's more to always be done. But secondly, the General Assembly took action for a lot of reforms, removing some of these inequities in our laws, right? So we did marijuana justice uh, by passing marijuana reforms, something that disproportionately, yes, give that a clap because this is something that disproportionately targets our communities, right? Uh, we then, then banned no-knock warrants, you know, chokeholds, abolished the death penalty. Again, these are conversations about the progresses we have made. I would like us to see us, you know, decriminalize mental health. You know, that is a part of this conversation. More training on disabilities. My son is an autistic kid, a black man, 23 years old. And if he has some type of reaction due to a stressor, someone can miscommunicate that. Today, my son does not want to drive. And this happened even though the Trayvon Martin case was not something about driving. All of these things that he has seen as a child, he was like, Mom, being a black man in America is tough and I don't wanna die. And I said, I don't wanna bury you. And so these are the hard conversations that we are having in our households. But again, it comes from these reforms could not have been possible unless we had representation. And Thank we took action. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Delegate Cohen. Thank you. Um, well, justice reform is the, is the way out of 140 House and Senate members, I ended up on paper being the most bipartisan of everyone. Um, because I cross party lines a lot. If you haven't figured it out, I'm the only Republican up here, I think. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I did a lot of work in justice reform. Um, one, part of that is because I'm a big believer in second chances. Um, two, I firsthand witnessed an entire community of mainly single female-led households because their partner was incarcerated for a lot of them. And it is important that if we want families to be successful, whether they're together, married or not, having two people who are able to help raise kids and have incomes is important. And it's important that we give men a chance to be good fathers and to have better jobs. And if you have a criminal record following you around once you're not incarcerated, it's very difficult to do that. And so. Uh, I do think it's part of the conversation about women and, uh, and about children as well. We did make some progress. Um, I was um, very supportive of Senator McClellan and Delegate Jeff Bourne's bill um, to allow the um, mental health of individuals to be brought forward when they are in a courtroom. We weren't allowing that to be used as part of their evidence for their defense, and we were able to pass legislation this year that allows that to happen. Um, we also did a lot of work in those areas of justice reform associated with sentencing, um, a whole lot of work in the areas of sentencing. We dot, did a lot of work in the area of those um, who are suffering from the disease of addiction and working towards decriminalizing that disease and allowing folks to have the help that they need from healthcare as opposed to sitting in our jails waiting until they get out um, to get assistance in many cases. So we made some progress. There's still a lot more work to be done in the area of justice reform um, and we'll continue, hopefully, working on that in a bipartisan way as well. Well, the time has come for us to, to wrap our, our conversation, but we want to give just about 30 seconds for each of our panelists to give a, uh, a charge to this group, and that is, what can the audience do to affect change? We're going to start with the Honorable Carrie Corner. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you. 
Um, well, you know, I started in the, my area, I'm a small business owner, and I started working for a gentleman 20 years ago, and I was the only woman ever in any meeting in Chesterfield County, ever, in every meeting I went to, the only female present all the time. And so when I had an opportunity to go to the high school that was close, public high school that was closest to my office and look at hiring interns out of their technical school program, I chose a female every single time because if she could see that I was doing it, then she would go back and tell classmates that they could do it. And so every year I made it a point that I was going to select a female student to work in my office. And if we all open our eyes to other young women around us and are willing to bring them alongside with us, if we're willing to volunteer to serve on hiring boards, if we're willing to serve on boards of nonprofits and groups that give you opportunities to network with other people and speak up for other women to be recruited to serve, then we can all be part of that solution. So that would be my charge. We all have roles that we serve in. Bring another woman alongside with you, especially younger women. Encourage them um, to walk with you. Um, I, I guess uh, to be really sort of succinct, I, I think show up speak up and vote. You know, show up to the places in community where we, decisions are made. Speak up and show up to your legislator's office. You know, we welcome it. You have a lot of power to do that. You can email us anytime, but you can also come and see us. Uh, you know, we have a lot of, ac Virginians don't realize how much access they have to their delegate. And then vote. Vote for people who are you know, really valuing through actions and words of what you believe in, what you care about, and what you think will make us future forward. Thank you. Um, one thing we didn't get to get, uh, get to today was black maternal mortality. And I'm really excited that you know, um, Representative Delegate Adams, excuse me, you mentioned that doulas are something that we're trying to push for in terms of our, um, our bills. I would like to ask you all to make sure that we're following up. So once we get something passed, if there's no money behind it, if there's no, not enough staff behind it, it's not helping anyone. So we need to make sure that we have funds, full funds, behind all of these initiatives. If you are saying we're supporting doulas, are we paying them enough so that they can do that full time? You can't be helping someone at the, at the bedside if you have to work three other jobs. So we have to fully fund our doulas. There's a professional certified doula here today, Jessica, and thank you for coming, but you have to make sure that you all are trained and you have the money to pursue the training so that they can really advocate for women at the bedside. So let's follow up on these doula bills, on the momnibus in Congress. All these things must come to fruition and be funded. Thank you. I'm, I'm just gonna basically reiterate what the delegate said. Advocate, advocate, advocate for those issues that are important to you. Show up, speak up, speak out. And then when you rise, bring someone along with you. Good. I couldn't have said it better. I am proud to sit on this panel with all these wonderful, powerful women that are speaking truth to light today. And uh, I, I just want to echo be intentional. And this means being intentional about voting, but who you put into these seats. We got to do our homework. Um, I am a proponent of bringing women to the table and making sure if you're looking down at someone, make sure you're helping them up. So those are just a little <laughs> sage words of wisdom that Delegate McQuinn has always told me or, and my mother and so many others uh, because it does take a village for one woman to be successful. It takes all of us. Thank, thank you. Thank you so very much. Let's give all of our panelists a big, big round of applause. We can do better than that. This has been an outstanding conversation. We thank you all for your attendance here, for being engaged and listening. Uh, but I ask the charge that we give is that you rededicate yourself to working together, understanding that we are indeed our sister's keeper, and we have a responsibility and an obligation to and for each other. And that goes across racial lines. Uh, our nation, our world is browning right before our very eyes. But I leave you this. In short, that empowered women empower women. Peace and power. I'll turn it now over to Delegate McQuinn.
Let's give our moderator a round of applause. Woo! She's pretty cool, I guess. <laughs> Listen, I just, we're not going to hold you long anymore, and we thank you, audience, for being so amazing. But I really want to thank this panelist, who are pretty awesome. You guys were just absolutely extraordinary as you shared the inner thoughts and opinions and expertise with all of us. All of us are going to walk away a lot smarter, right? Right? Yeah. And understanding what we need to do and how we need to move forward, uh, particularly as women, uh, joining forces, joining arms, and you know, battling all of the challenges that we're dealing with in, in society. And even though we talked uh, today about the whole issue of equity and, and particularly, focus, particularly focusing on black women and women of color, I know women, period. Okay, we have all been discriminated against. There's always been issues. Again, uh, I think in terms of, no, I know, in terms of black women, women of color, uh, it is the incident has been much higher, you know, from the way some of us wear our hair to what we wear in the workplace or, but however, we know as females that it's been an issue from the beginning of time, okay? And we're still fighting that battle. And so if we want to get on to, you know, get on this road for, that will lead to progress. We must work together. We must bring awareness. We must have these kind of conversations and, um, and, and, and intervention and be uh, clear about how we need to promote one another, hold each other up, and then uh, walk together in, in this, uh, on this road that's often difficult for us. So again, thank you so much for, for your work. Um, at this time, I want to just present a, a package to every panelist, okay, and to our moderator. I was getting ready to say there's only two packages here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. Uh, Again, thanks to Virginia Union University, to Felicia Cosby, who's been just exceptional in helping to get this plan. And she's been with a team. Can you guys hold up the committee, and as well as those individuals from the office? And then we have some volunteers to come today. Would you please stand up? And so we can just thank you for your work today, wherever they are. Again, I hope you all have had a great time uh, this moment of conversation, this lunch, uh, I don't think that this should be uh, the last one. We should continue this work and, uh, and making certain that this is happening in every corner of our commonwealth. But certainly for those of us who are in close proximity, we've got to find ways to work together. We've got to find ways to walk together in, on this journey. And this is the only way we're going to begin to pull down, again, I'm going, bi going biblical on you, these strongholds that are barriers to us being successful, accomplishing what we know that we should be accomplishing, and being put in places where those opportunities are there for our generation and the gener next generation, and you know, we just got to swing that door open and make sure that every female have a right to walk through that door, sit in that seat at the table, as, as Holla also say, often say, not be on the menu, and then make a difference. God bless you, and thank you for coming. Thank you, bless you. <laughs>